we get into uh, the study, I would like you all to watch a small video. This is a small video, a small animated video uh, that uh, I have asked the media team to present on the screen. And then I will go into a study. This is about a, a person who steals cookies. <laughs> words they say. All right, 
let's uh, begin. The lady was so fond of that biscuit, she uh, went and bought a biscuit. I don't, I don't agree with all what she did, <laughs> but she, she liked that biscuit, but, uh, uh, and since she mistook that uh, that man was sharing his biscuit, but in, but in reality, she was sharing this man's biscuit. Uh, and this is a small story of a, of a cookie thief. Likewise, uh, today we studied about uh, stealing. It is possible that we could also steal from God. And we may not know that we are stealing from God. But God is kind and generous like that man. He is kind and generous. But we have to know uh, if we are really stealing from God. And this is the, the topic. Biblical principles on true tithing. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 21, we are going to pray and begin, but before that, let's just read one verse. Romans chapter 2 and verse 21, Paul writes, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? So if we teach others, can we not practice what we teach? And if we preach not to steal, will we also steal? That's what Paul is saying. And if you go down that chapter, he's speaking about uh, committing adultery and doing all things that are contrary against God's law. So as I said, this is a topic that uh, was requested by the branch, so let us prayerfully read through the Word of God and understand. I want to say a few things. Uh, this is not what I think. This is not what my personal opinion is, but I am just preaching God's Word. So let us have an open mind as we go through this subject. We will take questions very procedurally. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand uh, and wait for your turn. And as the opportunity presents, I will let you ask the question and we will respond uh, by God's grace. If there are questions that I cannot answer, we will take it and we will answer it in the next possibility. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious, mighty God, we are so thankful to you for this moment, for the freedom of worship, where we can come in your presence and sit and study your word. Lord, we are so thankful to you for the great truth that you have kept in your word for us, helping us to live a righteous life, a sober life, a godly life, in this present age. Now, as we study this very important topic of, of true tithing, I pray that your spirit will be our teacher. Soften our minds and open our hearts that we may be able to understand the truth and the truth shall set us free and the truth shall produce in us 30, a 60 and a 100 fold for God. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. When Jesus was on this earth, Jesus said and did things that were so new and fresh and so different for people who lived around him. One of the things or principles that Jesus commonly taught was give and it shall be given unto you. Now, this world, the philosophy of this world is not give and it shall be given. The philosophy and the teaching of this world is get and get and keep getting so that you can amass a lot of wealth 
for you. Right? But when Jesus came, excuse me. But when Jesus came, he did and he did some things, he said some things, uh, he shared his understanding in a way that was so new and fresh. In fact, uh, we have verses in the Bible that says that people said, what manner of man is this person? No man ever talked like this man. Even his disciples at one occasion, they looked at Jesus and they said, after Jesus calmed the sea at the storm, uh, the disciples looked at Jesus and they said, what manner of man is this person? The wind and the sea, they obey him. So Jesus did things, he said things which were so different and not normal according to the times in which he lived. And one of the principles that Jesus taught is in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Jesus said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Now the reason this philosophy or this principle was so strange when Jesus said this was because this principle was not of this world. This principle was from heaven. This is heaven's principle. We read in the Bible that God gave. What did God give? He gave everything. And he did not even spare his son. And so the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this principle of giving is heavenly principle is godly principle. It is not of this world. And that is why this principle was so strange when Jesus said it. As I said today, we are dealing with the subject of true tithing. Now tithing, uh, some of us may know what a tithe is. Some of us may not know what a tithe is. So today we are going to understand the aspects of true tithing. Basically, what we are going to do is we are going to understand what is a tithe. All right? And then we are going to understand why should we return tithe. <coughs> and then, when should we return tithe? Where should I bring my tithe to? To whom should I give my tithe? And finally, how is my tithe used? Basically, the what, the why, the where, the when, the whom, and the how of the principle of true tithing is what we are going to understand today from God's word. I want to start with this. Tithing is an investment you cannot lose. In other words, you will never regret that you returned God's tithe. How do I say? On the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, you will not stand to the left of God's side and God is going to look at you and say, you are standing on the left side. You know what the left side is. The left side are not going to heaven. So God is not going to look at you on the left side and say, you are not going into heaven because you paid your tithe. Are you, are you following me? So you are not going to regret. Maybe the other, other possibility, the other way is true. So you are not going to be judged by God that you are not going to go to heaven because you were truthful in your tithe. Now I did not count this, but I am just taking a pastor for granted. He said uh, tithe is mentioned 14 times uh, in the Bible and 24 times in plural. Tithe. 13 times, uh, 14 times, and tithes in plural, 24 times. And did you also know, uh, this pastor said, one-fifth of everything Jesus said was about money. What is about finance? One-fifth. In other words, for every five words, every one word Jesus said was about Money was about finances, or about how we can be truthful to God in our finances. 
Now I understand that some people may think that uh, why do we have to speak about tithe? Why do we have to speak about offerings? Is the church always behind uh, money? The church behind uh, accumulating wealth, taking money from the pocket of the church members and accumulating money. Well, you are going to find out that this is not about accumulation of wealth of the church. This is not about that. This is about a blessing God has promised on this condition. And we're going to see why God has put this condition in the first place and what am I to do with this condition. Now, there are a lot of people who believe that they have earned wealth, that they have earned their own income, and what they have is really theirs. And so they think, and this is, this is an unusually strange idea, at least for the Christians, they believe what I have made, what I have earned with the sweat of my brow, with the work of my hands, is really mine and I am not going to give it to the church. Some people think like that. I want to understand two very important principles before we go into deeper study of this topic. Two very important principles. Number one, first of all, everything belongs to God and He gives us the strength to earn wealth. That's the first principle we all must understand. What's the first principle? Everything belongs to God and the, uh, even the wealth that belongs to us is not ours, it is God's. Number two, the second principle, number two, in giving tithe or offerings, in giving to in giving to the church, in giving tithe to the church, in giving it, you are really not giving it to a bureaucratic, organizational institution. You are not giving it to the church. I am speaking about the tithe. You are giving it to the Lord. These are the two principles we have to understand. I am going, going to develop on these two principles and explain to you from the scripture how this works. Principle number one. Everything belongs to God. Even the wealth, the money, the income that I earn with my strength is God's. And we are soon going to define what is I, my and all that. Number two, the second principle. What's the second principle? Everything belongs to God and what I earn is God's. That's the first principle. What's the second principle? In giving the tithe, you are not giving it to the church, but you are giving it to the Lord. That principle we need to understand very clearly. We are going to understand this. Now, come with me to uh, Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Look at what David says. 24 and verse 1. Can one of you please read Psalm 24 and verse 1? We are studying the first principle in detail. Psalm 24 and verse 1. Yes, please. Yes. Amen. So the Bible says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and the world, and they that dwell therein. Amen. God is the creator of the world. Not just this world. There are many other worlds. The entire universe, the planet and all that is. And here the psalmist David says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Now, can you help me understand what is the fullness thereof? What does that mean? Everything? Yes, everything. The 
the produce yes can you itemize fullness for me can you itemize the sunlight, the air, the trees, the, trees, water, the water, the animals, Which part of everything we don't understand? <laughs> the gold in South Africa. The gold in South Africa is the Lord's. The diamonds of Botswana is the Lord's. I'm going to give you an item, itemized list. The sheep in New Zealand. The cows in Argentina. The cotton and the spices of India. The, the wool in Argentina, Australia, the rice in China, the beautiful flowers and the dairy produce of the Netherlands. Everything is the Lord's, including you and me. Psalm 50, this is a wonderful uh, psalm, Psalm 50, reading from verse 10, Psalm 50 from verse 10. 10 to 15. Psalm 50, 10 to 15. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I like this verse, right? Every beast of the forest, and a cattle, and the cattle upon a thousand hills is whose? Is God's, is the Lord's. The Lord says, I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field because they are mine. God has called every single bird by name. He knows everything. Every fowl, everything belongs to God. And then he says something interesting. Verse 12. He says, if I were hungry, if I were hungry, I would not tell you why? Because the whole world is mine and the fullness, the same word is used here, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Pay thy vows. In this context, he's saying, pay your vows unto the Most High. And then he says in verse 15, And then you call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. You see, the, if, if, if God was hungry, he need not tell you and me. Why? Because all the bananas in Uganda and all the pinyas, the pineapple of Philippines, they are belonging to our God. Everything belongs to our God except one thing. Everything in the world belongs to God except your sins and my sins. That belongs to us. But even that, God sent his son and took it on him. And that's what the Bible says. I'm, I'm still establishing the first principle. Everything in the world belongs to God. There's nothing that does not belong to God. And in that first principle, I also said, everything belongs to God and even the wealth and the income that I earn is from God. You read that in Deuteronomy, you know Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 17 and 18. Here Moses says, when you go into the promised land, be very sure, don't make this mistake. Don't make this mistake. Be very careful about this. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 17 and 18.
he is talking about how uh, in the previous verses he is talking about how God rescued them uh, from the Red Sea experience, how God saved them, how God saved them from the fiery serpents in the wilderness. We, we studied about all that, how God fed them with manna and how God fed them with water. And then he says, verse 17, And thou say in thy heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. All right? If you said that, if you say in your heart, you don't even have to say it out aloud. You don't even have to whisper this to your wife or husband or your friends. You don't even have to say. If you said in your heart, ah, you know something? The car that I bought, ah, that's mine. This house that you see, I built it. The job, you know, I'm working here as a this and that. And this is my job. If you said that in your heart, the next verse, the Bible says, but thou shalt, what? Remember. Remember the Lord thy God. It is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Is it clear? The first principle, everything is the Lord's. And everything that I have, everything that I own, everything is because the Lord gave it to me. It is not even my power. Because the Bible says, He gives me power to what? To work. And because I work from the power that God gives me, I can ac accumulate what? Wealth. Or I can get income. 2,000, 3,000 euros per month, whatever it is. Right? I can accumulate wealth. And this money that comes to me, whose is that? Maybe in your paycheck, maybe in your pay slip, it says Anderson. But it is actually the Lord's. We need to understand this. So God said to Moses, tell the people of Israel very carefully to store this in their mind. When you go into the promised land, never ever say even in your heart, I did this. It is because of my power. It is because of my brain. It is because of my influence. It is because of my strength. No. It is God who gives you the strength. Think about this. I just want you to think. I think I'm, I'm doing well today. This strength that God has given me today, it can go disappear at the second. I have known people who, have, who are so healthy, they look so strong and they look so brave, but at the fraction of a second, they either lost their lives or they were bedridden and they could not work. So we must always acknowledge that God has given us the mind which we can, the brain, the intelligence, the thinking capacity to, to use it to work and then to bring an income. It is the Lord's. If you are a person who works in physical labor, understand it is not because of the food that you eat. It is not because of the land that you live in. It is because of God. So please understand, my dear friends, principle number one. Everything in the world is the Lord's. And everything that you have is because the Lord gave it to you. And He can remove it from you like this. How do we know? We know it from the story of Job. Job was a wealthy man. Yes. He had many children. Yes. How many days or years did it take for Job to lose his wealth? Like this. But it wasn't the Lord that said remove it. Yes. He allowed it. He allowed it. We all know. I'm just, I'm just saying how things can go off from your hand like this. 
Job even lo lo uh, lost his health at the fraction of a second. You see, so we have to always attribute, understand this. You always give it to God, glorify God, say glory to God, praise be to God. It is God who has given this to me. It is not me. All right, so I, I'm, I'm spending on the, uh, time on this so you really understand uh, in, in your mind, in the deep of your heart, you know that this is of God and there's nothing of yourself. And by the way, this word says, remember. Why does this word say remember? The same word used in the Sabbath commandment. Remember. Why? Because we often tend to forget. And so God said, remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? We forget to keep it holy. Sometimes... Uh, in, our, in our home when the Sabbath is on, uh, we try not to speak our own words, we try not to speak our own things. And sometimes when I speak something, uh, my wife reminds me, she says, dear, I think you should stop. This is not a topic for the Sabbath. And I remind my wife, oh, hold on, I think this is not something that we should talk, discuss today. Remember. So likewise, in this uh, uh, with the relation to this topic, we always most often think that this is me, this is my things, that this is... No. Remember. Remember it is the Lord. So what I'm saying here, wealth is a gift. Income is a gift from God. It is not your right. It is a gift. Your finances are really a gift from God. God gives it to us. In other words, all things come from God. The talent I have to make money, the talents that I have that I use to make money comes from God. The job comes from God. My children, my wife, husband, the car that I drive, the house that I live in, the clothes that I wear, everything comes from God. Who are we then? Who are we? We are just stewards. We are just managers, in other words. And not permanent managers. We are temporary stewards of God's things on earth. That is who we are. In fact, our own existence in this life is a gift from God. I did not choose to be born in this world. Did you choose? No. No one chose to be born in this world, right? But the Bible says God chose you by name. Even before you were born, He called you, which means you are a gift in this world. Every breath that I take, this could be my last breath. Did you think about it? God gave this breath to me. Every time I take the breath, it is coming from God. Because God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. When I take this breath, I say, thank you, Lord, because you have given me a gift to live. He sustains our life, every heartbeat, Every pulse, every breath, every breath of air is from God. Why do we say that? Because we are gods by creation. We read in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. The Bible says, the second part, uh, the second or the first part. Let's see. Acts chapter 17 and verse 28. Yeah, the first part of the verse says, for in him, Acts chapter 17 verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. We live, we move, I can move my hand now because God gives me the strength to move my hand. I know people who cannot move their hand. But to me, to me, it is a gift. And so, how can I say, thank you, God? 
How can you say, thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, for the gift of job, for the gift of the car that you drive, for the heat that you have in your home during winter, for the warm blankets you have, for the good bed you sleep? How do you say thank you to God for all the gifts? On your knees before God, you thank him for the roof above your head, for the food on the table, for the shoes on your feet, for the clothes on your body. We say thank you. You know, every opportunity, every ability to, to, to earn one euro is from God. One cent is from God. You know, that's, that's really an acknowledgement. We must acknowledge that God gives us everything. But the question is this. Is just a mere thank you enough? If you say thank you, God, you kneel, on, on, you kneel in your house, in the closet, and say, thank you, Lord, for everything. Is that enough? Is that enough? How do you say thank you? Thank you, G. Th thank you, Jesse. David asked this question. Thank you. David asked this question. Come with me to Psalm 116 and verse 12. Psalm 116, verse 12. David is asking this very important question. Thank you, I needed that cup of water. Psalm 116 and verse 12. David says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? What shall I give to the Lord for all the benefits that he has given to me? Do you ask this question? What shall I give to the Lord for all his benefits. Huh? Evangelize the world to the other people. Okay. Evangelize, share the gospel message. Yes. That is a way to say thank you. Today we studied uh, in the morning mess in the sermon. Obedience is the highest form of worship. Obedience to God is the highest form of worship. You now we can obey God. And that is what he really requires of us. You now this question is asked by David in Psalm 116. But his son answers this question. Uh, who is his son? Solomon. Solomon answers his question. How can we thank the Lord for all his benefits? First Chronicles chapter 29 from verses 11 to 14. First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 to 14. The last chapter of the First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 29, 11 to 14. Shall I read? Thine, O Lord, is the greatness First Chronicles chapter 29, 11 to 14. Solomon uh, says here, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And then he says, Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. This is what we've studied so far, right? Verse 13, Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. What is Solomon saying here? 
He said, you are the great God. You are victory. You are majesty. You are power. You are strength. And then he says, we thank you because you are glorious. Your name is glorious. And then look at verse 14. What does he say? He says something very interesting. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own we have given thee. In other words, what Solomon is saying, listen, who do you think I am? Or what does my people think they are? To think, listen to this. He's saying, Solomon is saying, who am I to think? Okay. And who are my people to think that they are giving something to God out of their own? Are you following me? In other words, if I give something to God, probably in tangible money, I will not say that I have given this to God. Who am I to say that? When I have got everything from the hands of God, and then he says, we are giving it back to you from what you have given us. So who am I to think? Who are my people to think that we are anybody to give anything to God? Principle number one, everything comes from God. Everything that you have comes from God. Can anyone out give God can you outgive God? No. No. Even if you give everything you have, God has still given his precious son. And nothing can compare to what he has given. Nothing. So what Solomon is saying is, how can we even think that this is ours and we are giving it to God? This is my tithe. This is my offering. This is my money. And I'm going to give it to God. You can't say that. Why? Out of his hand we've received. And to him we give. Actually Solomon uh, says this nicely. He says here. For all things come of thee. And of thine own. Have we given thee. Which means from what you have. We have given it to you. In other words, what, we are, what God has given comes to our fingers and through our fingers it goes back to God. That's how we should think. Nothing is really ours. You see, the foundation of ownership is... Can anyone complete this? Fill in the blanks. The foundation of ownership. If I say I own something... How can I say that I own something? Creation. If I created something, I can say that this is mine. Or if I have bought something with a price and it legally belongs to me, it is mine. But the Bible says the whole world is God's, including you. So what can we say? That something is ours and we are giving to God. Hmm? That's why when God created everything, he gave all things under Adam and Eve's ownership. Ownership? Ownership? Stewardship. When God created everything, he gave to Adam and Eve not as owners but as managers yes. you read in Genesis chapter 1 26 and 28 he said you will now have what dominion not ownership he didn't say dominion is not ownership he will say you have ownership uh, sorry you have stewardship 
dominionship. That is why Adam had to give an account to God of how things were happening on earth. That is why he was one of the rulers of this world. We studied about that in the 24 elders topic. You know, there are 24 elders. These are the rulers or the representatives of the unfallen worlds. And they all report to God. Why? Because they are not owners. They are stewards. Likewise, we are the children of Adam. We are all stewards of what God has. What is God has, God has given us? Children. We are The children are not our children. They are God's. And we are just stewards of the children. That is why God, when we stand in the day of judgment, if your children are not there, then he will ask you. Yes. You and I are accountable to God for our children. Yes. Why is your son, your daughter not on this side? Mm-hmm. Have you been a good steward? Mm-hmm. Every single euro that God has given you, God will ask an account for it. Did you know? Yes. Every word, every idle thought, that crosses your mind, will have to stand before God on the day of judgment and give what? Account. Why? Because we are simply stewards. We are not owners. So God gave Adam dominion. He gave Adam management. He gave Adam administration. Supervisory responsibility. And so, Adam had to be accountable to God. Now, I want to ask you a few questions. How did Abraham thank God? We're talking about thanking God, right? How did Abraham thank God for all the benefits that God gave him? Okay. Okay. He thanked God uh, in many ways. Uh, I'm coming to that point. He thanked God in many ways. His, his life was uh, a testimony. He was not even willing to spare his son. Yes? He said, God, you have, you, have, you have given this son to me. And if you ask this son, I give it to you. That was his faith. He said, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving him to you. Abraham. Yes. What did I say? Oh, okay. Sorry. Maybe I said Adam, I don't know. But Abraham. Abraham, he didn't even hold his only begotten son from the Lord. Which means that his life was a life of thankfulness to God. But there is a specific incident in the Bible. Uh, In Genesis chapter 14, you read about that. I'll just give you a quick background. Genesis chapter 14. Uh, Who was Lot? Nephew, Abraham's nephew, uh, Abraham's brother's son, right? Uh, and we know the story. I don't want to go into the details, but Abraham and Lot separated, and Lot chose the fertile lands in the valleys of the plain, uh, which was Sodom and Gomorrah, and he lived there, and, and Abraham was living again in the mountains. And one day, a news comes to Abraham and says, uh, Abraham... Four kings joined together and they went and attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and they defeated Sodom and Gomorrah and they've taken everyone captive, including your brother Lot. And so what does a good brother do? Went to rescue. Went to rescue. A good brother does not say, ah, all right, now you, you have learned your lesson. You wanted that good plains, right? You chose that fertile land, right? Now you learn your lesson. No, he didn't say that. His heart was beating fast. I'm just dramatizing. And he chose 318 men from from his own house and he went to make war with three other kings. He went to make war with the other four kings. He won them. They won them. And then he's bringing all the captives back. And when he's bringing all the captives back, and in those days, when a king had won the great battle, all the people, all the cattle, all the possession, 
all the gold silver whatever belong to the victor okay and so the king of sodom uh, comes out to meet abraham and he says abraham you have redeemed us by the way this is a salvation story you have redeemed us from this enemy and so this sodom uh, this king of sodom says take everything take all the riches of sodom but just leave the people you know uh, i like how abraham responds he says here and this is yes and this is this is this this is why we say that abraham always thanked god for the blessings he said king i'm not going to take one thread yeah or a shoelace from here you know why otherwise you are going to say that i made abraham rich so i am not going to take even one shoelace one thread because you know why because my riches comes from that god abraham acknowledged that god is the possessor of heaven and earth and all things and if he can give he will give it is not for the king of sodom to give him it is really not the king of sodoms it is who's it is god's he is establishing that there it's not you who are giving me you think that you are giving me this and i am not going to take this why because unless god gives it to me i will not take it amen, amen. how did jacob thank god how did jacob thank god do you know the story of jacob jacob cheated his father and his brother and out of fear uh, rebecca says uh, go escape to laban and then he runs off and there he is so troubled and one night on the journey he prays and then he sleeps and then he gets a dream what is the dream what does he see in the dream the ladder yes yes the ladder the ladder uh, was set from uh, from earth and it reached till the top of heaven and who was walking up and down angels who is the ladder by the way jesus is the ladder we read that in john chapter 3 okay so now we know this this is again a story of gospel this is a story of salvation jesus is the bridge between heaven and earth all right and because now jesus is the high priest the angels are walking up and down this ladder taking our petitions to the high priest that's what this means all right and in this dream uh, jacob says something very interesting G- genesis chapter 28 uh, 20 to 22 Genesis chapter 28 22 you need to read this see what he does Jacob 28 20 22 and Jacob vowed a vow saying if god will be with me and will keep me in this way that i go and he will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that i come again to my father's house in peace then shall the lord be my god and this stone which i have set for a pillar shall be god's house and of all that thou give me i will surely give what the tenth unto thee are you following what is jacob saying jacob is making a vow you know so tight vow jacob is making a promise to god you know what is jacob saying jacob is saying this listen jacob is saying god if you will be with me if you will give me bread to eat if you will give me clothes to wear and if you will bring me back in peace to my father's house i will give you my tithe i think we should there's a great lesson for us to learn here 
he's not asking for great things. He's asking for God to be with him, not for pasta or whatever to eat, bread to eat, and f- just some clothes to wear. And he's asking for peace and protection. You know something? There's a reverse uh, uh, lesson here. If we pay our tithe faithfully from Jacob's story, because he did, you will have peace, you will have God's protection, your water and bread is for sure, and you will have nothing to lack. That's this promise. That's what he says. They get problems uh, um, uh, from the government. How do we go? What do we do with that? Because people from the welfare say if you can pay tithes, then you don't need. And which part, and also the question, uh, which part of my, um, my, my tent uh, do I have to give? And do I have to give it one, in one uh, at the same time? Or, uh, or I can give tithes uh, afterwards uh, from uh, what I have left over. Okay. Leftover is after expenses? Is that what you're? Okay. Okay. It's how difficult I make it for myself, or what are the the um, expenses that I have? Okay. Well, we're going to study about that, but I'll give you a quick answer, Sister Beverly. The Bible calls tithe as the first fruit, which means that it should be first, and everything else is second. So that answers the question. We're going to study about that in detail, why the Lord says the first fruit. So in other words, when, the, when I receive my salary, the first thing that I should do is take the tithe and keep it separately. That is first fruit. In the Old, and, uh, not in the, in the, in the old Testament time, uh, the first grain that comes from the field, the first grape fruit, the first fig fruits that come, they take that and they bring it to the Lord. So that's why it's called as first fruit. And here in the, we're going to read many verses which says that tithe is God's first fruit. So it is not after your expenses, it is before, it's not on the leftover. We have a small question, yeah. which is very important. Yeah. If I have my vacation money, for example, or I get for my birthday, I get uh, 300 euros, how about that? Is that also like that? Do I have to pay tithe also for that? Yes, because the Bible says, of your every increase. Increase. Every increase. Yes. (laughs) Dutch is all I I get, all my uh, incomes. So uh, you need to explain maybe the difference between increase and income. Well, there's, uh, yeah. Income is basically a standard steady flow of money for the work that you do. That is called as income. 
salary salary or in uh, or compensation or enumeration that's what is income but increase is can be in gifts increase means something that increases your status it can be financial status it can be any status so increase can be a, a gift or an extra allowance or a bonus that you did not expect or expected those are increases and the bible says pay tithe in all your increases and in one way the increase could also be seen as the income this will come under that category but income and increases are two different things okay and so the bible is very clear it says in all your increases so uh, when when you give to your children uh, for example 10 euros for their birthday then teach them to place 1 euro to god and use the 9 euros for them because it is their increase okay so that is why <laughs> i used to think when i uh, get money from my father i said i know if i don't know if i should say this or not but i say if you're giving me money give me 11 rupees <laughs> <laughs> But, but so that i can have 10 no no give to god what is god's okay so notice here jacob is not only asking for financial blessings but is asking for peace and protection i want to tell you this friends when we are faithful in tithe God's peace and protection will abide with us. This is this is a promise he has given in the Bible. We have to he says test me and see if I will not give you this blessing. You know many blessings in life we easily ignore but God gives us something credible in return for our faithfulness. In other words what am I saying? Returning tithe is an act of completed mm-hmm. obedience faith. Huh? Faith. faith it's an act of faith in obedience to god he says god i don't know you said it and i'm doing it you take care of my problems and that's exactly what jacob is saying here to god god you take care of my problems but i'm going to make sure that i'm going to be faithful to you So Abraham said thank you to God not just by his life but he gave something of course we know that it all comes from God Jacob gave the 1/10 and here the tithe is quantified as 1/10 in this verse if you have 10 if God gives you 10 uh, you you give one to God if God gives you 100 you give 10 to god and that is tithe as children we are we all uh, i mean to our children we also teach them how to tithe in the small pocket monies that god uh, that god allows us to give them uh, by way they know that they are being faithful to god when we step out to follow jesus he promises to bless us and care for our needs it need not always be financial blessings it is much more i think about this i want you to think how many rich people i used to and even now sometimes i should say when i see a a, a, a businessman or a beautiful house or a car i say oh this is good and sometimes my mind goes a little oh, should i also have that car i think like that sometimes but i'm consciously straining my mind now uh to say god you've given me everything and that is enough i wanted to say something it just escaped my mind okay i will leave that there we're going to read uh, malachi but we're going to come to that later uh there's going to be amazing blessing that you can you cannot im- oh by the way the israelites what blessings did they have the israelites they gave all their first fruits the tithe they were all sincere 
40 years later, their clothes did not, their clothes did not wear off. Somebody said dirty. Maybe it got dirty. I don't know. <laughs> yes. The shoes were not broken. You see, you understand what I'm saying? There, there's a verse in the Bible. I can't, I can't remember where, but you can read. Their clothes did not tear. And their shoe did not tear for 40 years until they reached the promised land. And throughout the journey, they were faithful to God. I mean, they were, of course, unfaithful, but in this matter. You see, so what, what God is saying is, it's not just about clothes and shoes and food. It is much more. Ah, this is what I wanted to say. How many people we know are rich? Somebody said, you can buy the best bed in the world, but can you buy sleep? You can buy the best food in the world, but can you really uh, know that it is healthy and that it may be sweet to your mouth, but some people, some people earn so much, but they are diabetic and they cannot eat as much sweets they want to eat. You see, these are the blessings that God promises to us. You know, one thing is to accumulate wealth, but the other thing is not to enjoy the wealth. But God says, when you are faithful in this matter, you will not only get the blessings, but you will also get to enjoy the blessings. And that is the special blessing God gives His people. Even though we have small salary, even though we have little quantity of things, God has given us peace in our heart. I can say something about those people because I started mentioning mm. what people don't know is even those people believe in what the Bible says about tithing and do it. They do it because they believe that the Bible says what the Bible says about paying tithe and get increased. So they do it. Yeah. So don't mistake about that. Some <laughs> people they that don't believe in the Bible do yeah. what the Bible says. Some people do that, and I also had a list of, of those folks who do that. But I'm speaking in general. Don't get me wrong. I'm speaking in general. I don't want to criticize the rich people alone. Okay. I'm going to give you a few bad examples in the Bible. There was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon, right? Uh, by the way, we are still in principle number one. What is principle number one? Everything belongs to God, all things belong to God, and all that I have comes from God. And we read that in Daniel, by the way, you're reading the book of Daniel. We read that in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. One day, this king Nebuchadnezzar got to his, uh, the roof of the palace, the terrace. Uh, by the way, uh, Babylon had thick walls, had thick walls. In fact, they had double walls. That's why they said Babylon is a world empire, no one could breach the walls of Babylon. That is why when Babylon was attacked by Media and Persia, they could not breach the wall, but they went under. All right, so that's, and so he's standing on this roof, the Babylon, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Is Oh, by the way, one more interesting detail. These walls were so huge and they were so wide that they used to conduct chariot races on the wall. Horse races. Horse races on the walls of Babylon. It was so huge. And it was a magnificent empire. And here Nebuchadnezzar stands uh, on the terrace. And then he looks at all the Babylon that he built. And then he says in Daniel chapter 4 verse 30 and onwards. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? For the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my. You should not read my majesty, my power, I. No, I. My. My honor. The Bible says 
the word was still in his mouth when an angel came and said condemnation you are done for seven years for seven years you are going to be like an animal in the forest and he was driven away right there he was driven away from his kingdom and for seven years he ate like an animal and the dew of heaven fell upon him all nails grown like a animal you see so principle number 1 don't ever think in your mind this is i'm teaching you from the bible don't ever think in your mind the talents that god has given you if you're beautiful say thank you lord i have a beautiful face god has given it don't ever try to make it more beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and then you would say because of this makeup i look more beautiful that's what i'm trying to say god has given you all things and acknowledge god when we do not acknowledge god when we do not live with the consciousness that everything belongs to god we are withholding the glory that god deserves this is the sin that moses did and shut him out of canaan should i should we bring water for you in place of god sister white says in one moment moses eclipsed the glory that was due to god so don't never we should do that second bad example there was another king by the name of herod we read that in acts chapter 12 it's not the same herod who lived at the time of jesus uh, jesus's birth but this herod we read one day this herod sat he was arrayed in royal apparel sat upon his throne and gave a great speech we read that in acts chapter 12 from verses 21 to 23 he gave a great speech and then all the people shouted this was after jesus's crucifixion and resurrection of course and all the people shouted it is the voice of god and not of man Acts chapter 12 verses 21 to 23. Do you know the story? King Herod dressed in his royal apparel and then he sat and gave a great speech and he said uh, and all the people shouted and said O king this is not this is not a man this is God. This is God who is sitting in front of us. What should Herod have done? what should herod have done herod should have said stop stop i am not god i am man and i am not the voice of god i am just man but herod did not say it you know what happened the angel of the lord smote him because he gave not god the glory he was eaten by worms right there he was eaten by worms and he gave up the ghost verse 24 says acts 1224 but the word of god grew and multiplied the word of god grew and multiplied so when we do not acknowledge when we do not acknowledge god when we do not when we when we do not acknowledge god and when we do not live with the consciousness that everything belongs to god we are withholding from god the acknowledgement and the glory god deserves and this is a very dangerous sin so do not think we should never think that i am giving tithe or offering to god out of my own pocket out of my own income because it is god's i'm trying to get across i'm trying to get across to you the seriousness of living with the consciousness that everything belongs to god and when we withhold anything from god simply we are placing our life at risk king nebuchadnezzar lost his kingdom 
He got it back when he repented. And Herod lost his life. Question. for a month and uh, they tell you yeah God will understand that I couldn't pay it this time but if we read in Haggai Haggai how you call it Haggai, Haggai yeah what Haggai we in the first chapter mm. we can see that is a that there is a curse for those who don't return the tithes and <clears throat> and sometimes I think uh, the offer to you, I think so. Because verse 5, he does say, Now therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have so, so much and bring little. Ye eat but you have not enough, not enough. You drink, but ye are not unfilled with drink. Mm. Ye close you, but there is none one. And he that earns a wage, earnest wage to put it into a bag with holes. And to make it short, it said in verse 9, Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you, when ye br brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why said the Lord of hosts, <clears throat> because of my house that is waste, and ye run every man into his own house. These things, they are serious, you know. Mm. This is a serious matter because we can think that we can do what we want, but it's not true. Mm. It's not true. Maybe let them understand. They spray here over the camera. They're talking here about money. And uh, if we um, neglect to return our tithes, because some people they say pay, but you don't pay no tithe, you return it. And uh, if we um, don't return our tithes, uh, it will be a curse for us. Or yeah. no? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, let me just explain. Haggai, this is the time when the, the temple of God was not built yet. Haggai. And here you read, uh, the, pro the word of the Lord came to the prophet and he said, Hey, guys, see here. You all are living in good houses. Okay. God is talking through his prophet to the people. You all are living in good houses, but look at my house. It is lying waste. And he's saying, when you think that, okay, I, because of my strength, I have brought so much. When you bring it to your house, God says, I'll blow, blow it off. So that, that's what he's saying. Well, we can lose things like this. The only thing that we have what we have is because God preserves those things for us. And we talked about the examples of Israelites, of how things did not wear out. And that's what they say here. Uh, is it, it, is it uh, verse 4, 1, 4. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lies waste? And then it says, you have sown much and bring in little, but the Ezekiel read it. Ye eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You're clothed, but you're not warm. 
See, that, that's what I'm saying. It's not just about financial blessings. It's about enjoying the blessings of God. Question. Yeah. A question. If it is so that we are giving our tithes, maybe that's not a nation, it's not a problem. Tithes, okay, I have enough left over. Thank you, Lord. It's everything, okay. But Sister Y says, the gifts, that is important. That's a challenge for us. Because we think the rest is for us, we can go uh, shopping, but, but that's not true. There, there the test is not uh, with the ties, but uh, with uh, the gifts. And that is to give to God's house and to do God's work. Yeah, I fully agree on that. In fact, I was going to say that I missed the last sentence. This Haggai was actually, this is talking about offerings free will offerings, it's not talking about tithe in this chapter because he's talking about building God's temple. And by the way, um, yeah, both, both are a test, but we don't have an exact percentage of what offerings, uh, what percentage of offerings we should bring to the Lord that God has left to each of us to decide. But we have a verse, Deuteronomy 16, 16, it says, uh, you bring to God according to the proportion of blessings that God has blessed you with. So you have to decide for your own family. If you are a married husband, uh, discuss with your wife. Uh, and decide, or if you are a single, decide for your own self how much the Lord has blessed and what percentage I will give to, the, to God on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. I'm going to talk more about that in the later, later part of this message. But I just wanted to clarify that point. Thank you, brother, for bringing that. Okay, so, listen, please. When we withhold your offering, when you withhold your offering, you are keeping back from God what is really His. And in the process, you are hindering the work of the gospel. When you withhold your tithe, you are keeping back from God what is rightfully His and in the process hindering the work of the gospel. Not just tithe and offering. When you are withholding your talents from the church, you are depriving God of something He gave you that you can give back in an unselfish service for the glory of God. We're not just talking about tithe and offering. We're also talking about the health that God has given you, the children God has given you, the responsibility God has given you, the influence God has given you in the society, the talents God has given you. If you are, a call is given by the elder or the pastor, can somebody uh, please uh, take up this position. It's vacant. If you know that you have the talent for the treasury department, to be the treasurer, or to be the evangelism leader, or to be the personal ministries leader, or to be the darkest leader, if you don't want to do that for your selfish reasons, you are hindering the work of the gospel. Yes. One question. Yes. Okay, good question. Well, offering and gifts are the same. But offerings and tithe is not the same. Tithe, the Bible, we are going to study about that in detail. I'm still not, I'm just touching the iceberg now. I've not gone in depth yet. But I'm just giving a short answer. Tithe is holy and it is to the Lord. Offerings, are not they're not saying we're not they we're not saying it's unholy but offerings are something that we give out of our 
generosity out of our thankfulness to God. But tithe is really not our money. Tithe comes to us, I mean the money comes to us and we return it, return it to God. But offerings we give out of our own heart, out of our own thankfulness. I'm going to, I'm going to give more differences as we go along in the message. Uh, okay, so all the material possession, our children, we are, if we are depriving God of what belongs to him, that is a violation of God's moral law. What is that? Thou shalt not steal. You may, you may ask, oh, transgression of the law is sin, right? So what if, what if I don't participate in the church? There's a call that, that the, the secretary department is vacant. Uh, can somebody fill it in? And if you know that you have the capability and if you're not coming forward, and God has, you see, God has given all of us spiritual gifts so that we, when we come as a church, we use those gifts for the service of the congregation for God's glory. But when God has given you that gift and you don't want to use it for God, which means that you are stealing. Uh -uh. You are stealing. You are depriving of God the blessing that He has given you for the purpose that He gave you. But you are not using that. It's a very serious uh, matter to think about. Okay, now, to show, to show, to really show uh, this biblical principle, God instituted a system to show thankfulness to God, that God owns everything, that everything belongs to God, and that nothing that I have is mine, you know, to, uh, to show that outwardly, visibly, God instituted a system called tithing. We read that, we, we of course read that uh, Abraham gave, Jacob gave, but we are going to go and see where God gave this. Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus chapter 27. Let's read verse 30 and 32. Leviticus 27, 30 and 32. Can one of you please read? Leviticus 27, 30 to 32. No, 30 and 32. 30 and 32. Yes. And all the tithe of the land, whether others of the sea, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. Okay. So here God is establishing a very important principle. He's saying here, that the tithe is number one, holy, and number two, it is the Lord's. Are you understanding? Please understand this. The tithe, tithe of what? Everything. Tithe of the land, uh, I mean, a tithe of the seed of the land, of the fruit of the tree, even the flocks and herds, everything belongs to God. And not just that, the, this verse says, number one, principle number one, the tithe is holy. Are you reading, reading that? The tithe is holy. And number two, the tithe belongs to God. Very clearly these verses tell us that the tithe is holy money and that the tithe belongs to God. So the tithe is not mine. Everything that I have is God's. Tithe is holy unto the Lord. Now question, when do you call something holy? 
or when does something become holy? When it is set apart. Huh? When it is set apart. When it is set apart. When it is holy. Okay. When it is set apart. There is. Okay, when it is set apart for special use. Yes, there's just one small detail that should be added to that response, but it is correct. When does something or someone become holy? Okay, for, before we answer that question, what are some of the things that are holy? What are some of the things that are holy? Huh? Holy Sabbath. Okay, your body is a temple, your body is holy. What else is holy? Marriage, huh? marriage. marriage is holy. Yes. It's called as holy matrimony. Yes. yes, marriage is holy. What else is holy? Come on. Ten huh? Ten commandments are holy. God is holy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, holy. God what? say we are holy people because if God is holy and we are his children then Okay, we are holy. Okay, what else is holy? Tithe is holy. Tithe is holy. Holy tithe. It's called as holy tithe. What else is holy? Holy spirit. Holy spirit. Holy communion. Holy it's called holy communion, not just communion, holy communion. What else is holy? You're missing something very important. The church. The church, yes. The word. The Bible. Bible is holy. You see. <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm not uh, answering that question. But I'm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's an in inspiration of God, but in a special sense, the Bible is called the Holy Bible. Now, I'm not denying that answer, but what I'm trying to say here is when something or someone becomes holy, when that something or someone is set apart for a special use, and when God fills that thing or that person, then it becomes holy. You know, we, 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 we set apart some things. For example, when we buy some things for the vessels of the sanctuary, we set apart that, but it's still not holy. It's not holy yet. It's set apart, it's not holy. But when we invoke God's blessing, when we pray and dedicate it to God, and when God blesses it, then it becomes holy. If your marriage does not contain God as the first person, it is not holy. No. Sabbath is holy. Why? It is, set, it is set apart from the rest of the six days. And God has infused himself in time. Now, can you, put, can you box God within time? Does God live in the dimension of time and space? But in the Sabbath commandment, God says, the 24 hours, it is mine. It is not yours. Which means that God has infused himself in this 24 hours. In some sense, I can't understand, in some sense, he is infusing himself in the dimension of time. And that is huge. In some sense, he's saying this tithe is holy because it is set apart for me and it is to me. Are you following? Bible is holy. That's why, oh, by the way, your marriage is holy. You're set apart, which means that you cannot go and mingle with other uh, ladies or other gents 
like how you behave with your wife or husband. Are you following me? Because you are set apart. This Bible is holy. You cannot simply put the Bible anywhere you want. You cannot. <coughs> Why? It's holy. I seen people put coffee cups and iPads and iPhones, all of that on top of the Bible. Please don't do that. This is set apart. Keep it. Give reverence. This is a symbol. This is this is the symbol. The written word is a symbol of the living word. This is representing Jesus Christ. Putting it on the floor. I've seen people put it on the floor. Don't. We should avoid doing that. In our home, if you come, you, you can see a Bible on top of a Bible, but not even a spirit of prophecy book. I'm not diminishing the spirit of prophecy. I'm just saying that Bible is Bible. Yes, Bible on top. Yes, sir. It's not the same thing, but uh, <laughs> let, uh, let us know. That's something that should not happen. Because the Bible is the word of God and it is holy. And we, it is not true, uh, nothing else to stop it. Mm -hmm. According to the situation, it will be on top of everything. If I am not coming here and my Bible is on this desk, I won't go to sit. Yes. Ja, ik heb een vraag. Um, ik praat absoluut niet. Um, <laughs> ik heb een vraag. Het is tien voor vijf. En wanneer krijgen we kans om onze vragen te stellen? Want ik heb wel een aantal prangende vragen. <laughs> en ik ben meestal wel langdradig. <laughs> okay. It depends on how long you are able to sit. <laughs> the whole day. Okay. Okay, the, the, reason, uh, the reason is I need to give you the right uh, settings when we come to understanding this concept. And I, my prayer is that as we go along, many of your questions will be answered. But if you still have questions, we will discuss it. Uh, but just, just bear a little bit time. Uh, if we have to continue this uh, session, we can also continue that. Okay, we can also continue. We don't have to rush. We don't have to rush through this, but it is also a matter of high importance. All right. Now, the purpose. Okay, so. Uh, maybe, indeed, uh, we can continue. But if everybody is okay, we continue and I feel the one time as well. Let me know. Uh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> uh, it's not only us, you know, because we have to also. Yes. Take a break. Oké, okay. we'll do that. Maar ik denk dat als ik om te schrijven te kunnen beantwoorden, dat is echt. Ja, ze is. 
Jesus says, uh, I have to know the last questions uh, is not enough. So I, I would say continue and then uh, make sure we have a part two. Okay. We will see as, as, as yeah, uh, uh, how, how far we can get through. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing is that I am trying to set the base for you so you will understand. The next time when you ask a question, when I answer, you will know the context. So you will understand it. Uh, that is why I am setting the base very uh, carefully by the grace of God. Okay, now, throughout scripture, God gives us varying tests. He invites us to give him one-seventh of our time. That's a test. What is one-seventh of our time? The Sabbath. the Sabbath. One day of the seven days. That's a test. Okay? He gives us another test in our life. One-tenth of our money. That's a test. Go back to Genesis. God gave Adam and Eve a test. What was that test? God's, yes, God said, you can eat of all the tree in the garden, but of one tree you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This tree belongs to me. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil belongs to me. You don't eat from that tree. The Sabbath is not your time. It is my day. Don't meddle with it. The tithe is not your money. It is mine. It is holy. Don't touch it. Are you following? So God is giving us test, just like how he gave the test to Adam and Eve. Did Adam and Eve succeed in the test? No. no. When Eve yielded to Satan's temptation and took and ate of the fruit of that tree, what did she do? She took what was God's and God's alone. When you use tithe for your personal reason, you are doing or committing the sin that Eve did. You are using what is God's and God's alone. When you are mismanaging the holy time of the Sabbath by speaking your own things, by doing your own things, you are touching into what is God's and God's alone. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a constant reminder that God is the creator and owner of all things. You may ask, why did God keep this test? Why did God even put this tree in the midst of the garden? To remind Adam and Eve, this is a very critical point, to remind Adam and Eve that they were not the owners because they were still restricted to that one tree. If they were the owners, they can freely go to that tree. But God said, remember, you are not the owner. How do you remember? Because there is a tree you cannot touch. Sabbath is a constant reminder that he is our creator. Are you following me? By Sabbath, this one day, it comes, that's why it's a reminder, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because I am the creator. Likewise, tithe is a reminder that he is the creator and that he gives the blessings of life. And so I cannot touch it. It is a reminder that God is the creator. Are we clear? So this is a test 
tight Sabbath is a test which will prove that God is the creator. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. The tree was a test of faith. The Sabbath was a, is a test of faith. Likewise, tithe and offerings are also a test of faith. Now, tithing is a very important aspect and it tests the loyalty and our faithfulness of our heart as does Sabbath. It tests where our affections are, where our heart is, and where our mind is. You know, on the Sabbath day, you can do many wonderful things, but the Lord says, you will not do it for your own pleasure, which means you will not do your own work, you will not wash your own clothes, you will not cook and eat your own nice meal, you are using that time because holy time, right? Sacred time. It's God's time. Use it not to speak your own words, but use it for God. So when we are doing all these things, we are putting our hand and reaching into what is God's and God's only. So when you are using that tithe for your own personal reasons, you are committing the sin of Eve and Adam. Human riches are not stable. We can make money, we can lose money. We can make money quickly, we can also lose money quickly. There is no stability in trusting human riches. But God says that if you are faithful, your future, your security is with me. That is why it is an act of faith. We need to trust God in this. Okay, now, we, so far we've understood what is a tithe. Any questions? The presence of God. What makes something holy is the very presence of God. For example, for example, Moses stood on the mountain and there was a burning bush. And Moses saw that burning bush and he came close and then he heard a voice, Moses, Moses. And he said, Yeah, Lord, who are you? And he said, Remove your sandals from off your foot. For where you stand is what? Holy ground. Holy ground. What made that ground holy? The very presence of God. But how can I make the translation to when I'm talking about tithes? Yes. So as we said, the presence of God makes something holy. Right? And this money is set apart for a very special use. And so this money cannot be used for any jolly well reason. It must be used for a very specific reason. And we're going to talk about what is that reason. That's the next topic. Okay. That's the next topic. And in some way, God is infusing himself and blessing this money like the five loaves and two fishes and blessing this money so it can be used for God's glory. And that is what is making this money holy. Oh, by the way, uh, the tithe is holy, which means that it needs to be used for a special purpose. My mother used to have a habit. Uh, in India, uh, in those days, uh, they used to receive salary by cash. And in an envelope and, and my father and mother used to take that money and put it on a different envelope and we've seen that why because it has to be separate we're just saying to God that God we are, we, this money is not with other money we're putting that separately and I do that today I re, when I receive the money in my account my salary in my account as fast as I can I move that to another account and I say this is going for for God's work, for to the church. 
all right so i'm just giving you don't have to follow this but this is my conviction and this is how i do all right uh sister that does answer your question yes okay now so we've talked about what is a tithe so far and we've established two very important principles okay now how is the tithe to be used No. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. What is the second principle, by the way? The money is uh, to be used to uh, is for the of God. Exactly. The money that uh, the tithe that we are bringing in giving it to the church, we are not giving it to the church, but we are giving it to the Lord. We are coming to that point. That's the second principle. Okay. Now, how is the tithe to be used? Question: How many tribes were there in Israel? Twelve. How many tribes? Twelve. Twelve. That was the trick question. <laughs> there were thirteen tribes in Israel. The Levites was not a tribe. <laughs> no, it was a tribe. <laughs> okay. There were 13 tribes in Israel. How many sons did Jacob have? 12, 13. 13? He had 13 children. Yes. <laughs> Jacob had 13 children, 12 sons and one daughter. But Israel had 13 tribes. How? Yes. Yes. When before Jacob died, he blessed Joseph and he said, Joseph, in your place, I'm going to bless both of your sons as my sons. And so Ephraim and Manasseh, they were the sons of Joseph. And so he adds them as his sons. And so there are 13 tribes of Israel. But why do we say 12 tribes? That's because when God gave the promised land, let, let's, let's read it. When God gave the promised land, he said, one tribe will not get any inheritance of land. Who is that tribe? The Levites. The Levites will not get any inheritance. Why? Ah, because God said, I am their inheritance. And they will not get any inheritance in Canaan. Let's read that. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20. Numbers is the third book. Third or fourth? Fourth book. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20. Can one of you please read? Verse 20? Yes. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in the land. Neither shall thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thy inheritance among the children of Israel. Okay. So the Lord said, the Levites will not have any inheritance in the land of Israel because I am. The Lord is their inheritance. Now, who are the Levites? The Levites were set apart. For a special purpose. For what purpose? To work, huh? to work in the sanctuary is the correct answer. To work in the Lord's sanctuary. In other words, to be of service to the congregation of Israel. You see, the Levites were doctors. The Levites were religious leaders. They were uh, involved in temple ministry. They were judges. They were also teachers of the doctrine of the law, which means that they had a full-time job. Why did, I, why did I say they were doctors? You know, there are several stories in the Bible. The priest is the one who pronounces something clean or unclean. And if somebody has a sickness and if the Lord cured them, they come with an offering and the priest inspects yes. if they are truly cured. So they had, think about this, 
there were millions of people, the Israelites. And these people, the 12 tribes of people, were of service to the congregation. Then they had a full-time job, not just in the temple. Of course, they were connected to the temple service, but they were actually servicing or providing spiritual service to who? To who? To the congregation, to the congregation of Israel. Now, the question is, how should the Levites live if they did not have any inheritance? How should... How should the Levites live if they did not have any inheritance? Read the next verse. The answer is in the next verse. Numbers chapter 18 verse 21. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tents in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay. Now, this is a very important verse that you must underline. Listen. How will the Levites live? They will live from, that, from all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance. Which means they will live off of the tithe that Israel brings to the temple or, or the tabernacle. Now, there is something we are missing here. Let's read that verse again. Just the first part. Brother Ramaya, could you please read? The first part. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tents in Israel for an inheritance. What, what are we missing? What are we missing here? I have given the children of A very, very important truth. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tents in in Israel for an okay. <laughs> okay. There are three things in this text very important. Number one, the Levites will live off of the tithe that all the rest of the twelve tribes will bring. All right. Yeah. That is first truth. The second thing, why do they get all the tithe? What makes them eligible? Because they provide service. For the congregation. That's a good point. Yes. Now, <laughs> we are coming to that. I know your question. <laughs> now, now, the third very important truth in this verse. Don't misunderstand. misunderstand. Yes. Consecrated to the Lord. Yeah. Instead of uh, the firstborn son, God chose Levi. He chose them yes. uh, like a kind of tithe. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we, we, we studied about that. Uh, uh, during the Passover, God said, All the firstborn are consecrated to me. Mm -hmm. You remember that? When God did not only kill the firstborn of the Egyptians, He consecrated the firstborn of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And then later, God says, All right. I'm going to now choose the Levites mm -hmm. as the firstborn of Israel. And we also talked about it. Why God did that? Was that God's mistake no. of choosing the firstborn? No. This has a greater implication. Uh, we'll, we'll speak about that. That's a different subject. Now, there's a very important truth given here. This is very important. The Levites should live off of the of the tithe that is brought by the children of Israel. Now, who is paying the children of Israel? Who is paying the children of Israel? Uh, sorry, who is paying the Levites? That is a wrong answer. We read the verse again. Yes. You see, this is very important truth. The Lord says, I am paying the Levites. This is a very critical point we have to understand. I am coming to this later in the message. Maybe verse 24 will explain. Yes, we are coming to 24 also. Yes. 
this, this concept uh, uh, reiterates in the Bible. So, who is paying the Levites? God. God. Never, never think that the children of Israel were paying the Levites. In other words, listen to this. The church members are not paying the pastors. Very important. The church members, you and I, are not paying our pastors. Who is paying the pastors? God. God. But he's using the tithe. And the tithe is not our money. It is God's. I'm coming to your question. <laughs> we? We? Yes. He's saying what, brother? I didn't... Un for we. Pay the... Yes. Correct. That is a wrong understanding. Yes. That's a very wrong understanding. We are not paying anybody. Yes. Even before we pay the tithe, the tithe is God's. <laughs> yes. No, but you're right. I, I understood your point. You're right. But the, the point is this. God, that's why this is so beautiful. God says the, 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 the tenth of what I have given you is mine. So he's not saying you go, of course you bring it to the temple, but he says that you are giving it to me. Didn't we understand that two principles? The tithe is holy unto the children of Israel. Unto the, Lord. the tithe is holy unto the Levites. Unto the, Lord. the tithe is holy unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the tithe is really not your money. It is the Lord. And so the Lord says, I, because this is my money, I am giving it to the Levites. So we should never think that we are paying the pastors. If a church member says, I don't like the pastor, I don't like the tie he wears, <laughs> and I will not pay him, you are wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. Okay. We are not paying. This is critically important to understand. Some members think that they pay the salary of the pastors. No. The fact is the church members do not pay the salary of the pastors. God pays the salary of the pastors. The Levites met the spiritual needs of the congregation. That was their full-time job. And so God said, I'm going to pay you with the tithes that I have commanded the children of Israel to return. Let's also read Numbers, the same chapter 24, verse 24. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 24. Actually, the message gets more interesting from this point. <laughs> Numbers chapter 18 and verse 24. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said unto them, among the children of Israel shall they have no inheritance. Now think about the life of a Levite. His whole life is a life of faith. Why? Because he has no land, no allotment, no inheritance to give his children. But his inheritance is the Lord. Today we are the Levites. We all are. Not just the pastors of the church. We all are. We all are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. It has a spiritual meaning to this. The concept is expressed all over again. In today's terms, okay, by the way, by the way, for what reason was the tithe uh, given to the Levites? Huh? You are right. For the service which they served. Yes. For the service which they... For the service which they rendered 
to the congregation of Israel. In today's terminology, it means that the tithe is dedicated specifically for the preaching of the gospel, for the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the world. The gospel of the two ends of the everlasting gospel. The gospel, yes, the everlasting gospel. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 28, Acts chapter 1, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach what? Teach what? The next verse says, Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then what does he say? Yes. Teaching them to? to ah, teaching them to observe the commandments and the statutes and the judgments. I have two questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but we know all the statues. We are we are done. John was a Levite. Who? John. Uh -huh. John the Baptist was a Levite. Did he get a, a tithe from the people who were his congregation? Because he did service to God. Well, he was, a, he was a Levite, I know no, for no. sure. Yeah, I mean, he was a son of Zechariah, so he was a Levite, yes. yes. But, but listen, this is, this is for the people or the Levites who are working in the sanctuary. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind that the, the, the whole uh, analogy of the temple service is going to change in a few short days or years mm -hmm. from John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. The whole analogy is going to change. There is not going to be any temple. There is not going to be any Levite or Judah or Israel, I mean uh, a Jew or a non-Jew or a In Gentile. Time, there was still a temple and yes. a Levite from the synagogue. Yes. And he was a Levite but not from the synagogue. Yes, but he was not in the synagogue. Yes. He had a special calling. But the Levites in the synagogue enjoyed the tithe of the land. Just answering to the specific point, but I'm saying that, that the things are going to change in a few years from the point of John. We're going to cover that as well. Okay, now, there's an interesting detail in Numbers chapter 18. There's another interesting detail. Numbers, the same chapter 18 and verse 26. Can you read please? Numbers chapter 18 and verse 26. Now speak unto the Levites mm. and say unto them, mm. When you take of the children of Israel the tithes mm. which I have given you from them for your inheritance, mm. then ye shall offer up a meat offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. Okay. Do you understand what this is? The Levites, I will explain sister, the Levites when they received the tithe from the people of Israel, okay, yes, the Lord said the Levites should then take a tithe from this tithe and then give it to the Lord, which means a tithe of the tithe. And what's going to happen with that tithe? Yes. That was given to the sons of Aaron. That was given to the sons of Aaron. The, the second tithe. Or the tithe not, or not the second tithe, the tithe of the tithe. But yeah, the second tithe is a different context. We'll come to that later. Yes, the tithe of the Levites. You see, the tithe of the people of Israel went to the Levites. The tithe of the Levites went to the priest and their sons, which is Aaron. If you think about this, this is, a, this is fascinating. But they were also Levites. They were also. They were also. So they received twice. No. Well, they received what the Levites gave. They received what the Levites, not the, the non-priestly Levites. Okay, let me say. There were many people in the sanctuary the Levites in the sanctuary. 
uh, there were uh, people who used to clean the sanctuary. There were people who used to uh, do music, uh, blow trumpets in the sanctuary. M musicians were in the sanctuary. We read that in, uh, I, I forgot his name, uh, As Asfer or Asolved. He was the musician, a Levi musician in the temple. <coughs> yes. And then we have treasurers in the sanctuary. So all these were Levites. They had different functions and roles to play. And there were judges, as I said. There were peop the priests who were taking care of uh, in, uh, uh, inspecting people for their sicknesses. Uh, judges were sitting and judging the people's cases. So all these people were there. So these were non-priestly Levites. God said the high priest must come from Aaron and his family. And so the Levites received the tithe from the children of Israel. And from this tithe, the Levites brought the tithe to Aaron. Now think about this. What tithe are we speaking about here? Grains and nuts and fruits and all of this, right? If everything was brought to Aaron and, and his sons, how much can they eat? But that is why, think, it's very, very wonderful. That's why God said, bring it to the Levites and the Levites will give a one-tenth of that to the priests, their sons and their families. We are following the same system in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm going to speak about that also later. It's the same concept that we are also following. Or maybe I should say this now. When we bring our tithe into God's church now, all right, all the churches here in this local conference, the tithe is going to the local conference, which is the union conference. Right? You know that? Do you know that? No tithe stays back in the church, in the local church. All the tithe goes back to the local conference. What does the local conference do with it? They take a tithe of that tithe. Are you following me? The local conference takes a tithe of all the tithe that received from all the churches and they send the tithe to the division conference. Or to, or, or to the division, uh, division treasury. Okay. This is how the church is organized. Local church. I can have a board or something. Local church. The local churches are all grouped under one local conference. The local conferences. That, there could be many conferences. They are all grouped under the union conference. No, no. Union is for the Netherlands. Yes. So the union, there are many unions under one division. We are coming under the inter-European division. Okay, there are 13 divisions, uh, 13 or 8? 13 divisions around the globe in our church. And the divisions are all making up the general conference. The general conference is the highest body. Yes. The general conference is the highest office. So now, when the churches all give the tithe, the churches all give their tithe, all the tithe goes to the local conference. And the local conference takes a tithe from that and gives it to the union conference. So the union conference receives tithe from several local conferences. Yes. Are you following? Yes, I know the system. Okay. Now, the union conference then takes a tithe of that tithe money and then sends it to the division. Division receives tithe money from many union conferences. And now the union confer uh, division conference will send the tithe to the general conference. This is how it works. And that's based on this principle. So it stops with general conference. It stops with general conference. And the general conference, the general conference is getting that one tenth of from around the world, and they use it. And as I said, the tithe is used only for one purpose: proclamation of the gospel. Uh, I have. Uh, I have a number of questions. I have a couple of Just one question, sister. Oh, okay. One question to you. <laughs> One question to you. Is it, is it so far, the question that you have so far is connected to what I've already presented? Yes. Then go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
I have a couple of questions that are a little bit confusing. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the um, tithes to my house. I have a question. Are you so far that you, I can ask these questions or am I walking ahead of uh, your topic? Not yet. Okay. We, are, we are addressing, that's why there's a question, where to bring the tithes? What is a storehouse? We are going to address that. Okay. No. Yes, please. Okay, anything, uh, any other questions from anyone so far? No. Okay. Now, basically the reason was, why was that the Levites were the ministers of Israel and they were supposed to, there's one more reason to this. The Levites were supposed to give a tithe. Why? Simple question, why? It was a test for them also. Very good. The other reason is the Levites were to set a good example to the Israelites. If the Levites did not set a good example, how can they receive tithe? But how can you know that a Levite is get doing a good example, setting a good example? How can I know to be concrete? Uh, concrete, who can equate? Dat, um, of gaat het alleen maar om vertrouwen? Dat bijvoorbeeld een ouderling wel zijn tijd geeft en ik wel ik mijn tijd moet geven. Sister is saying, how can I know if uh, a Levite is a uh, um, uh, certain example? Or uh, how can I know if a minister or uh, a leader uh, or do I just have to trust? <laughs> well, that's a personal question. You just take the phone call, make a phone call. <laughs> That's all. Make a phone call and ask him. <laughs> yeah. tithes were not used uh, properly, mm -hmm. then they would be hunger under the Levites. From what will they eat, etc. I don't see no record in the Bible that Levites die of starvation, for example. Malachi. Yeah. So the system worked because it was a big tribe, and none of them died. Um, I, the, the Malachi, uh, had, in Malachi you can uh, hear about the problem that uh, they were not getting the tithe, and uh, that uh, God said bring the tithe, uh, um, uh, for you. because the Levites were not uh, doing the work they had to do, because they had to take care of themselves by being uh, farmers and things like that. So, otherwise they would have starved. Yes, we are, we are addressing that point as well. No, no but because no. in Malachi the tithes were not being paid, um, they had to take care of themselves. And that's why God um, uh, uh, says in Malachi that to bring the tithes. Uh, to we, the we'll come to Malachi, yeah, you're right, we'll come to Malachi. But, but what you're saying is right, Brother uh, Elder Sydney. You're right. If the And I gave tithes. If I see that the Levites, if I can use that word to, as a remark, if they are not busy, I'm, uh, I'm bringing the uh, everlasting message. Okay, that's a good question. We're coming to that question. We're coming to that question now. I'm going to take that question. So, we'll just conclude on this point. How can a minister ask the congregation to return tithe if the minister himself is not faithful in tithing? And so God said, this is in God's wisdom, and so God said, the ministers also, the Levites also will tithe 
on the tithe that they have received. Now, I have to clarify something here. I have heard some very ridiculous arguments. All right. I'm saying this ridiculous is because we're speaking about God's matters and some people take it too far. They say that this is a tithed money. For example, if there are 4,000 euros and of the 4,000 euros I have tithed, which means 400 euros goes as tithe. So the remaining 3,600 euros is tithed money. So clear? Am, am I clear? Yeah, the 3600 euros is tithed money. It's clean money, basically, in the eyes of God. Because the 400 euros have gone out. And now, when, from this 3600 euros, if I give to Elder Romeo 1000 euros, there is an argument that people bring. I, uh, brother uh, Elder Romeo asks me, uh, Brother, uh, this thousand euros that you've given, is this tithed money? Yes. Then I don't have to pay tithe. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. 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 This is the argument that people use. It's not fair. It is not right. Because tithe is on an individual basis. What I get, I don't care whether it is tithed or not tithed. If it comes to me, it is an increase for me. And I pay the tithe on that. That is also why here we understand that the Levites had to tithe on the tithes that they received. It was still God's holy money. It was still tithed. But still the Levites had to tithe on this tithe. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now we have to ask a very important question. We're going to ask and we're going to stop. <laughs> the very important question. What if the priesthood became very corrupt? <laughs> what if the Levites became very corrupt? Should I return my tithe. The reason I am asking this question is the Lord said that the Levites will receive the tithe because they provided service to the congregation of Israel. What kind of service? Spiritual service. They met the spiritual need of the people. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is what if the Levites became corrupt and they did not do their job? In other words, that they did not proclaim the gospel. They did not preach the gospel. Should we pay tithe? Yes, because God will not punish them. Okay. I think that it's God's responsibility. I say I think yes because it's God's responsibility. If a, a minister or uh, a priest, uh, yeah, a pastor uh, is not paying his tithes, then it's uh, God's res responsibility that he's not paying his tithe. But for for no, that was my no. if he's not doing his job, that's what he has to do. Oh, okay. If if the Levite is not doing his job, should we still pay tithe to the Levites? Why do you say yes, sister? Um, yeah, because I think that it's, uh, it's their responsibility to God. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. And if they are not doing their job, we all going to stand in front of the Lord. We have to give, a, how do you say, account to our yes. deeds. Okay. 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 
I will only say no to that as if I see in God's word that he's tell me if they're not um, paying the tithes or doing what the Lord tell them to do. And the Lord tell me then I could don't pay the tithe to them. Then yes, but I think we should just obey God because um, God will take care of everything that is not going good. The three sisters have answered, the three sisters have answered very beautifully. And I'm going to expand on that. I'm going to come to Brother Ezekiel. But I'm going to expand on that. Yes, only faith. You know, they show a text in the Bible that says that you do not return tithe when you see a priest or a Levite is corrupt. Please, your question. If there is a Bible verse that shows us clearly that God commands us not to return tithe when we see corrupt priesthood, then we will stop paying our, our returning our tithe to the corrupt priesthood or the corrupt Levites. I'm going to, I'm, there's, a, there's more explanation, not, just not this, but I'm going to take an exp, uh, a comment. What the quill is <laughs> what I want to say is this. In uh, back home, when I was in Bonner, I was, a uh, long time ago, I was treasurer. And I can't tell you, I can't tell nobody how much a minister is uh, me, this yet. Because when we send the money to Curacao that time, mm -hmm. they, from there, they just pay them. And what I know is that they just take the tithe out of the salary first before they give it to them. Yes. They just take it out. Yes. And uh, I don't know for anyone, but it is a commandment of God. And we have to listen to the, to the Lord. And uh, something else we can read in 1 Corinthians 9, verse uh, 13, it said, do, you, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which uh, wait at the altar are partaker with the altar. Yeah. That's simple as that. If they thief it or not, if they steal it or not, it's not our concern. It is the Lord. Amen. God self will take care of them. Yeah. Thank you. What that was wonderful. We are going to do a, a detailed study on that first Corinthians chapter nine uh, later. Now later. Now yeah, Sister Violet. Just say after it. Yeah. Um, it's, oh. <laughs> Is it um, being a Kerosolanian? And yeah, being a Kerosolanian. And my father was a colporter. When they have to get pay, um, the mission in Curacao used to take out the tide first the t from your money and uh, the rest you get. Yeah. If that was correct or not. How can God bless them? It's not correct. It's not the way it has to be done. Because the Levites got their tithes and then they had to pay their tithes. What they were doing is just thinking they have to pay their tithes so we can withhold it for them. But it's not right. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if they decided, the workers decided that because 
I don't know if the workers decided that because I was too young and too small. But I know that that was going on. Mm -hmm. Because Daddy was a colporter, I know that that was going on. But I don't know if he told them, well, take out the tide or not. I don't know. But they used to do that. But I asked myself if it's, um, if it's something wrong they was doing or it's something that they self would, you know, decide on the link that um, they rather that. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. You said, show me a Bible text that says that you don't have to pay tithes if the Levites are corrupt. But I believe I sit here in the church because that I believe God not only talks through the Bible to me, but but also through the spirit of prophecy. But I'm still not prepared for this uh, uh, topic. But if you say I can have to prove it from the Bible, then okay, got your question. Got your question. Uh, I just I, I just would like to rephrase that question. Maybe I uh, maybe that was uh, not uh, polite, <laughs> spiritually polite. I just want to rephrase that question. I didn't mean show me a Bible text. I'm saying that I don't know of any Bible text. Let's put it that way. Rephrase that. Uh, I don't know of any Bible text in which God says your tithe. Your tithes must be based on the sincerity of the ministers. I have not seen a verse. To, to your question, Sister Majesty's question, the spirit of prophecy always never contradicts the Bible. Yes? We all agree? So when I say I am basing my faith on the Bible, it is going without question that I am also basing my faith on the spirit of prophecy because the spirit of prophecy does not say anything that the Bible does not say. Okay? So I'm just going to leave that to your question at that level. We'll come to that later. The spirit of prophecy is not contradicting the Bible anywhere. Okay. Okay, we have uh, 15 more minutes. If... I, I would still like to answer this question. Should we, should we return the tithe when we see corrupt priesthood? I can hold off at this point and answer any questions until this point or I can answer this question and then we can uh, discuss the remaining topic later. It's your choice. Okay, there's one question there. I don't know if any, anyone has seen the video. It's, it's a sermon about tithing that uh, Sister Ria shared with us in the group app. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very interesting uh, insights. One of the things, and that's an uh, answer to your question, I think. Uh, the question is, uh, should we pay our tithes if the priesthood is corrupt, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, let's look. Sorry? Okay, maybe, maybe I'm saying something that you already want to say, but yeah. can I? Yes, can I? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, if, if we turn to the book of Malachi, then we have this very famous verse. Um, if we look before that verse, we see that um, the priesthood was very corrupt, right? Yes. 
The priesthood is very corrupt. And then the Lord is saying, y you robbed me. From what? Yeah, from the tithes. So the priesthood is corrupt, but still God asks the, the tithes. Um, I'm, I'm, okay, that's, okay. Uh, that's one thing. I, he, yeah, he said it much better than I did. <laughs> okay. You, you are right, brother. We'll, we'll answer this question. We'll answer this and then we will wind down. Okay, now, please listen. Thank God for the Bible. The, in the Bible says that there were, there, were periods in, there were periods in the history of Israel when the priesthood of Israel was very corrupt. And the congregation would be tempted to say that we are not bringing our tithe into the storehouse because the priests are so corrupt. And that did happen. And what was God's response? God's response was the book of Malachi. The whole book. The whole book. God complains to the prophet Malachi that the priesthood of Israel is so corrupt. I'm going to give you a few examples. Just read a few verses. We, go, we, we jump quickly to Malachi chapter 3, but we should go to Malachi chapter 1. Go to Malachi chapter 1, read from verse 6. Malachi chapter 1, verses 6. A son honoreth his father and a servant his mother of master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests. priests. Here God is talking to the priests that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised my name? Are you following so far? God is speaking to the priests and he says, priests, you, have, you are corrupt because you have polluted my name. And the, they ask, 1 verse 6. Verse 7. Verse 7. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, this is okay. The Lord's table is okay to be polluted with uh, the bread, the kind of bread that they brought in. Verse 8. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto your governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, say the Lord of hosts. Are you following what I'm saying? You see here, God is complaining to Malachi about the priesthood which is very corrupt. You know what they did? The priest in, in Malachi's time, they would take, oh, by the way, what did God command? How should the sacrifices be? Without any defect, without any blemish. But what does the Bible say? What does God say? They sacrifice the blind, the sick, the lame, the deaf, and all kinds of things. You know why they did that? You know why they did? You know what they did? When the people brought the good animals, when the people brought the good and the best animals to God, they would keep that behind and they would take a, a blind, a sick animal and present it to the Lord. And soon after the sacrifice, they would take that animal, go to the market and sell it. That is stealing. Because they could not get the same money that they would get for the best animal for the blind and the sick and the lame. This is a terrible mistake. Yes, Brother Pedro. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, do I incur personal guilt before God if I financially support a 
church whose ministers might be in teaching error, miss in inappropriating church forms, or doing other wrongs. And then Ellen G. White, Ellen G. White says, Jesus praised a poor widow for making a gift to a religious organization that was on the verge of heaven's rejection. Luke 21, 2 to 4. Ms. White thought that even if church monies were misapplied, the donor would still receive God's blessing. When things are wrong our leadership, at leadership level, we have a duty to speak out plainly and openly in the right spirit and the proper ones. And we are still to pay our tithes into the conference treasury. Okay. Wonderful. That is very plain and clear. We're also going to speak about that in detail in the next time. But I want to, I want to close here in a few minutes. Now listen to this. The priests were corrupt. Thank you, Brother Pedro, for that. The priests were corrupt in offering polluted bread and polluted sacrifice on the altar of God. Okay? Is that, what, is that all what they did? No. Go to chapter 2 and see what else they did. Chapter 2, reading from verse 7 and 8. Can one of you please read? Mal Malachi chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of way. Hmm. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, what did they do? They not only polluted the sacrifice, but they went another step forward. You know what they did? They stopped preaching. They stopped preaching. Not just that. They went one more step forward. You know what they did? They caused the people to stumble. They caused the people to error. If you continue to read the book of Malachi, you will quickly notice, you will quickly notice that the nation of Israel was in a deplorable spiritual condition. Their spiritual state was going to tear off and much of that guilt was on the priesthood. And at this point, you would say, you would expect. Now is the right time for God to say, stop the tithes. This is the best time, right? Yeah? This is the best time in the, in the history of Israel for God to say, no more tithes for the Levites. I am going to punish these people. They have done terrible, wicked things. They have polluted my altar. All right? They, have, they, they, they said, the table of God is contemptible, which means... This is enough for God's, for God's table. This is enough. What is enough? Polluted bread. This blind is enough for God. That's what they said. Who are you to say that? They not only polluted the Lord's table. They not only sacrificed blind and the lame. They not only <coughs> misappropriated God's sacrifice. They not only stopped preaching. They went forward and was a stumbling block to the children of Israel. And you would expect, God would say, stop the tithe. But read the next chapter. Chapter 3. What does the Lord say? Let's read from verse 6. For I am the Lord. I, what I? Change not. The principle of tithe that I gave, I am not changing. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have kept not them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? You know, what is, what is return? What is return here? Huh? No, not that. Come back to the good way. 
it's not talking about tithe yet. You know what is he saying? God is calling for revival. God is calling for a transformation of heart. He said, come back to me, return to me and be converted. And then he says, how to be converted? In what to be revived? The next verse. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And God says, in tithes and in, not in tithes or offerings. In tithes and offerings. And now, God could have said, I'm stating to you again, the Levites are so corrupt. Don't bring the tithe. Says, no. And then he says this. Read verse 9. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Why? The children of Israel stopped bringing tithe. Just for the same reason. They were tempted. They said, these priests are doing all kind of havoc. Why should we give our tithe to them and they will live off happily? We are stopping our tithes. And so God said, there is a revival that is needed in the congregation. I will deal with the Levites later. That's a different story. That is between me and them. But what about you? Return to me. How? Be revived. Why? Be converted. On what issue? On the issue of tithe and offering. Read the next verse. And I'm going to stop there. Then God says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. There are two things that you need to notice in this verse. Number one, what does he say? Bring ye... Huh? All. Not almost. Bring ye all the tithe. And then he says, bring it into my storehouse. Now there's a big question, what is a storehouse? You know what? That same verse answers it. That same verse answers what's the storehouse. So we don't have to make a big deal out of this. What is the storehouse? Yes. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. My house. Storehouse is God's house. And we are going to speak about this uh, in detail in the next session. But listen, I, I can't stop with this. Just read the next verse. Read the next verse. And I, if you, if you brought all your tithes, okay, God said, I'll open you the windows and pour out a blessing, right? There's one more thing he said. And we often don't read this verse, but read this. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your wine cast her fruit before the time in the field, say the Lord of hosts. You know what he's saying? The destroyer, the devil will destroy everyone of your neighborhood. But I will put a hedge around your house so that that storm when it comes, it will not affect your house. And the grape and the wine that you have planted in your garden will not give its fruits in an untimely fashion. I will take care of that. That's the blessing. That's the blessing. You will have a car and it will give you good mileage. It will never break down. You don't have to take it to the garage. That's the blessing. Still we are need to know where is the house of the Lord. We, that's next topic. Yes. 
it is very clear now at this point in time what is the house of the lord but i will leave that to you we'll discuss that in the next but so far is it clear so this is the blessing that god it's not just finance friends it's peace of mind jacob prayed for that right for protection when you go out and come god will protect you how many times we have seen on the road when we go to distant places and preach and come many cars on the road punctured broken down for the glory of god till now nothing has happened to us why because i believe it is my faith and i tell my my wife it is my faith Un- until we are faithful to god god will carry like amen. eagles amen we don't believe in the brand or the uh, make of the car we believe in the god of heaven so i'm going to conclude at this point with this one statement if there is a bad person in the church leadership would you have to stop paying your tithe no the answer is no it does not depend on that we'll speak about that later in the next session did jesus have a judas in his group yes did jesus have a judas in his group you see some people say that the i'm not returning my tithe because there is apostasy in the church well there is apostasy in the church and i will not stand here and deny that but the church is not in apostasy are you following what i'm saying there could be apostasy in the church there could be one or two bad apples bad leaders but the church itself is not in apostasy Huh? Seventh the seventh day adventist church brother please what sister <laughs> the seventh day adventist church as an organization is not in apostasy this is the lord's church there could be apost don't mistake me there could be apostasy in the church may i ask a question yeah a very simple one yeah we join with the we are joined in the um uh rat van kerk um in the world churches world church council world church councils not okay. not adventist world church councils but all type of uh, churches the world church councils on the on the on the website sister yeah that's a that's a that's a huge topic let me just clarify one thing no one has ever read that document number 1 i'll tell you number 2 we don't know the details of that document number 3 number 3 we are talking about an organization union conferences are under the organization and right now until this point until the last uh, annual council all the union conferences the divisions had some sort of liberty to do what they thought was right but change, things are changing at the organizational level and sister white says god's church will look as if it's going to fall into apostasy as a whole but god's hand of protection is still on this church and this church will not fall it will stand the shaking of the church has already happened the people are already going out and coming in the bad people will go out god will preserve this church there's no doubt about it so the question is are there bad leaders in the church yes yes are there bad leadership in the church yes, yes. but is the seventh day adventist church god's chosen remnant church yes. for the last end time to preach the three angels message yes, yes. we we'll leave it with that we we'll leave it at that Yes. I didn't want to talk. Uh, but uh, what I uh, find is what um, the brother prayed heeft is uh, ben ik 100% zeker erachter. What is that? What is that? Yeah. What brother preaching I 100%. 100%. 
Uh, alleen, ik heb nog een aantal vragen die ik hoop dat het uh, zo voor een volgende keer verstaat het niet. Uh, Sorry, ja. Uh, uh, ja? Ja. En um, ik wil dat niemand mij verkeerd begrijpt, want ik. Want God zegt, als je um, je tiende um, geeft, dan zal ik jou, dan zal ik jou zegenen. En daar geloof ik gewoon voor 100% in. Dus ik zal niet een persoon zijn die mijn tiende zou over um, achterhouden. Want, want Gods belofte is altijd, is altijd waar gebleken. Dus ik wil alleen maar even prikkelen omdat we kritisch blijven nadenken over bepaalde zaken. Yes, thank you sister for your comments, I appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm saying this is, I'm just preaching God's word. There's no personal opinion or stance here. And so it is good that we are discussing these topics so that we can understand the light and understand the truth and we will make a conscious stand to follow the truth. Amen? Amen. Okay, shall we close with the word of prayer? Yes.